Palermo in front of the Palazzo Chiaramonte, which belonged to the very noble Chiaramonte family. But this is a really sad occasion because really what I wanted to talk about is what happened to this family when the Spanish Inquisition came here. Because during that time, this family was killed. In fact, one of the family, Andre, was executed on the spot. And that was the beginning of the Inquisition where there was the auto de fe, executions, trials, tortures, beheadings. There was a head on a pike right here. And of course, it became an era of religious intolerance. And in the novel, what matters is in 1493, when the Queen Isabella and, and King Ferdinand of Spain applied the Alhambra decree to Sicily and the Jews were expelled. It was truly, truly shocking to Sicily where Jews had been very well assimilated. And in fact, a lot of the citizenry, businessmen in Sicily, nobles in Sicily, just regular people wrote all of these letters saying, please don't do this. They petitioned the court in Spain. Please don't do this to the Jews. They just were actually shocked by it. But Spain ignored that. And actually, all of the Jews of Italy were expelled, 1493. Well, you see, this is a really serious subject. And I want to correct something I said at the end. I said the Jews of Italy, it's really the Jews of Sicily. And let me just reiterate, because I know there was a little bit of crowd noise there. But basically what I wanted to talk about tonight is the effect of the Spanish Inquisition. This is, you know, loyalty is a historical novel. But what was amazing to me as I did the research for it and learned more and more about Sicily, and you see me right there in Palermo in front of the Palazzo Chiar Chiaramante, is that it is horribly relevant and resonant today. So to go back in time, loyalty is set in the 1800s. But in the 1800s in Sicily, there were still the after effects of something that happened as far back as 1490. And 1490 was a time of the Spanish Inquisition. Now that was when the King and Queen of Spain basically issued something called the Alhambra Edict. And it was a law that said Jews had to, the exiled Jews, it was, the absolute ultimate act of anti-Semitism, religious intolerance, and for and and really using the law as a weapon against Jews. That uh, that Spanish Inquisition was enforced in Sicily, in Palermo, where that where the film was taken, and where I did all my research. One of the places I did my research, and there was a commission there, and they were at Pia that palazzo. It was a prison. Jews were imprisoned there. The edict was in force. There were 35,000 Jews in Sicily at the time. And as I said, although I don't know if you could hear, Jews were very well assimilated in the culture. It wasn't, there was, Sicily is the world's island. I want you to think of it that way. Don't really think of it as an Italian island because it kind of isn't. It's history, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, is there was Arab rule, there was French rule, there were Roman rule, there was Greek rule, there was Norman rule, there was all kinds of rule, and there, were, and there was Arab rule, and there was times of enormous religious tolerance, especially on the Arabs, and Jews flourished. They, they had, there was a Jewish quarter, which in Palermo is a very small city, so it was really only about two blocks, but they weren't required to live there like they were in Rome during the 1930s. But speaking specifically now, people who read Eternal in my last novel of historical fiction will know exactly what I'm talking about. And actually, it's the same exact principle. In other words, the Spanish Inquisition in the 1400s enforced in Sicily did the exact same thing that Mussolini did under fascism in 1930s, namely enforce a law, enact the law that would oust, discriminate against, allow torturing and even killing of Jews, and then use that law as a sword, not a shield. It's weaponizing law. And that's what the Spanish Inquisition did. And that's the spot they did it on. So there were 35 Jews in Sicily alone, and they had to leave the island. Now think about that. They were exiled from their home. Jews had been in, in Palermo for 15th century. Jews had been all over Sicily for that long. There were about 51 cities in, in Sicily, which is not a large island, that had 
prominent Jewish uh, populations, the most prominent was, and the most plentiful was in Palermo. Some 5,000 Jews were forced to leave, leave everything behind, get out or we'll kill you. That's what the Spanish Inquisition did because the only religion allowed from then on was Roman Catholicism. Jews were, what the, what some Jews were tortured, Jews were forced to convert. If the conversion was deemed not complete, whatever that means, Jews would be killed. Uh, and as I said in the thing, I don't know if you could hear, but the, the city just went into an uproar because it, it, Jews were so much part of the population, but in the end, the law was enforced to deadly, brutal, lethal, discriminatory ways. I was interested in that. I'll show you some of the pictures. Because as a lawyer, and as you know, you're always kind of writing about justice. Loyalty is a book about a lot of themes thematically. But there is, so it's about injustice and justice and how law can sometimes work injustice when it is supposed to work justice. And there's a main character in this book. It's a story of four characters in Sicily at the time of the rise of the mafia, which is another point we'll get to in a minute. And there is a very prominent Jewish character. One of the four is named Alfredo. And I don't want to tell you more about him because I just love him. But he is, embl is emblematic of what happened to do the Jews in the 1400s. Because what happened is that those who, were, who not everybody wanted to leave, but they were left terrified. But there were some who stayed behind and they practiced Judaism in secret. Now, you couldn't do that. There was no rabbi. There was no synagogue. There was no kosher butcher. There was no Torah. They had to be in hiding. They in fear of their lives. And I thought that is horrific. What can that be like for generations upon generations to, to live in hiding for fear of who you are, for religious persecution? And I, that's Alfredo. He believes he is the last Jew in Sicily. And he may well be. Because to fast forward to an article that was in the New York Times in 2017, talking about the re trying to get Jews to move back to Sicily, trying to convert all of the synagogues that had been there and convert it back to churches, convert it back again. They couldn't even get a minion, which is a kind of a, slit, a majority. They couldn't get 10 people. That was in 19, 2017. Think of this, that the Nazis, if you, these things are related. The Nazis in a much later era, it's the same principle. It's anti-Semitism to its most awful, horrific, criminal, murderous extreme, the Holocaust. The Nazis wanted a Jew-free, as they said, Europe. Well, Sicily was Jew-free, except for Alfredo, who was hiding his religion, his identity, and who he was. Those people who did that were called Moranos, which was the Spanish derogatory term for Jews who lived in secret. And I wanted to really explore that. Let me take a second to show you some of these, some of the, uh, what Palazzo Chiaramonte looks like. You couldn't see it that well in the, um, in the film. Ignore this because it's like a political poster for actually for someone who is being held wrongly. Now it's a symbol. You can walk through here and see the prisons, see where people were kept, see Hebrew scratched onto the walls from Jewish prisoners who were held in prison because of their religion and tortured and killed. Here is the sign. I, I also want you to see this, how old this stone is, how pitted, how weathered. It's right in the center of Palermo. It's really remarkable. And here is, so then I was so interested in this subject and I thought it was really important to bring out just like I had, just as I had at Eternal, I was really shocked at the modern day implications of this. So I went to what used to be the great synagogue of Palermo. This is it. Um, when the Spanish Inquisition came, they tore it out, they vandalized it, they broke the ark, they took all the religious articles and they converted it to a church. And now what the mayor of Palermo and a very prominent rabbi is doing, um, sent from Israel, is to try to have a resurgence, to try to get a synagogue going. But this is Sicily. This is modern day Palermo. And they don't even have a single synagogue because of this horrible thing. And you can see it, but here's the, the little bit of the reminders of the, the Giudecca, the so-called Jewish district. You can see Via Mesquita, which is the main street. And by the way, Mesquita is an Arab word. It was there from the time of Arabian rule, Muslim rule, and it, it, it was mean street of synagogues and churches. There it is in Hebrew. And by the way, one of the um, 
My research showed that the Hebrew is incorrect, so maybe we need to figure that out. And here's Via Calderai, which was a street that's very important, and I actually have it in loyalty. Can you see from the picture? I'm not holding this very well, but you'll see that this, it's just a beautiful little street, and it was the street in ancient times in the oldest part of Palermo, where uh, silversmiths and coppersmiths and tinsmiths all worked because that was a profession that Jews really excelled at. And as I said in an earlier vi video, Jews were amazing silversmiths and a lot of the silver work and the reliquary for St. Rosalia, which is in the Cathedral of Palermo, was made by Jewish silversmiths who were them who had been persecuted for centuries. It, to me, I, I think I mentioned last time, I want that, first I want you to know the facts. I'm still going to tell a story, and loyalty is a story of these four people, and how really compelling and dramatic. But sometimes history gives you that drama, and partly you really want people to know those facts. I love, well, I love you guys, and I love that you're so serious about books, and I love, too, that you bring so much and you kind of want to learn. That's how I feel about researching, and that's how I feel about writing. That's how I feel anytime I read historical fiction. I want to learn stuff. And so that's why Alfredo's in loyalty. And I think in a way you, you feel caught up in his story and all the twists and turns of it, but you also learn about the history in a way that is not just the history of Sicily, but it ends up being horribly resonant today. And it's really interesting vis-a-vis -vis Martin Luther King Day, which is today, because it's always a reminder to me every year of just equality and tolerance and justice and all of those ideals that I think of as American, but really are global. And all of us should try to aspire to so that these horrible things, the Holocaust, the Inquisition, uh, violence, anti-Semitism, uh, these shootings at synagogues do not reoccur. We have to stop them. And I think part of knowing about history is watching when it repeats itself and, and taking appropriate steps, whether it's speaking out, voting, whatever you have to do, we have to do it, especially on a day like this. Now, the other thing that happened today is interesting because I was talking about how the law was used during the Inquisition and subsequently to discriminate against Jews. So the law can be used to bad purposes. But today is a really special day in the law in Sicily. It's an incredible coincidence and a wonderful thing because sometimes the law does justice in Sicily. And today, I don't know if you heard the news, but there is a man named Matteo Messina Denaro. He is a mafia boss of all bosses. He is a straight up mafia Don. He is 60 year, 60 year old. Here's a picture of him. This very ordinary looking man was today arrested. He has been a fugitive for 30 years in Sicily. Where was he arrested? Palermo, because he was the Sicilian mob boss. And what he was actually convicted 30 years ago. So he's been a fugitive. He was convicted in absentia of a really horrific crime. And I kind of want to tell you about it for a moment because first it's very relevant today. And it's a lot about law and order and justice and injustice. And you get to see the law finally work. What he was convicted of, among other things, and several things, he was in a protection racket, just like the one in the book, actually. But what he did that was so awful, and what ended up being such an outrageous crime that all of Sicily was in an uproar, was about 30 years ago. It was actually in 1992. There were two very famous prosecutors, two of them. Right, Dale, I thought of you as soon as I saw this, yes. There were two prosecutors. There were anti-mafia prosecutors, as they're called in Sicily, because Sicily is always trying to deal with this problem at the same time it pretends to exist. And they were, they were named Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino, and they were crusaders. They were prosecutors. I've seen documentaries. I've read books about them. They gave up. They lived in a bunker. They prosecuted the biggest mafia trial at personal risk. Their families had to be hidden. They had to be hidden. They lived under lock and key. There were constant death threats against them, all for trying to rid Sicily of the mafia. Constant, constant threats. They're watched everywhere they go. They have bodyguards. But one day, one day, 
they've left Sicily. They're coming back from Palermo by plane. I took that plane. You take a plane from the airport and to get to Palermo, there's one road. You know, Palermo isn't like New York or like a lot of cities, there's 3 million roads. There's not. There's one highway that goes from the airport to Palermo. Whenever, the, whenever Borsellino and Falcone, the good guys, are always moved, whenever they have to go anywhere, everyone watches them, they have police escorts. Of course, the police escorts are looking to see if they're going to be ambushed, people shooting at them from the roadway. But what the mafia did on that horrible, horrible day 30 years ago was something very different. It was evil and it was diabolical. In fact, the nickname, the nickname of this guy who was arrested today is Diabolique. It's after a famous video, go, video game. But what they did was they planted a bomb under the highway. I am not talking about, there's no overpass. What they did was they excavated underneath the highway. So they didn't have to lie in wait or attack. They had a remote detonated bomb that when Borsellino and Falcone passed, the mafia blew up the entire highway. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Blew up the highway. Shoots into the air, horrific. It looked like a, it looked, I mean, a bomb had been dropped because a bomb had been sent up. Unbelievable distraction, unbelievable death. Both prosecutors just trying to do good for their country are killed instantly. Italy goes crazy. They, Sicily. Well, actually, Italy did too. Everybody was mad. This guy gets co convicted. De Niro gets convicted in absentia, is an, on a fugitive for 30 years. Today, they arrested him. They tracked him to a cancer clinic where he was receiving treatment in Palermo at age 60. I, when I was there, it was such a horrifying thing, and I wanted to learn about the history of the mafia in Palermo. And I know you won't get there, so I want to take a second to show you the exact spot where these wonderful prosecutors, I think his wife was killed. And this is the actual spot at the highway. And we drove up and down it and they have a memorial there. And that's the memorial marking the spot where Falcone and Borsellino were assassinated by Denaro and the mafia who were arrested today for it. Here's the Giardino della Memoria. They have a memorial garden there and it's so heartbreaking and you can see it. And also, I was so interested in it that I, and here's another view of it, you see these beautiful mountains, and they speculate that the mafia was, had the remote control somewhere in the mountains, so they were at a distance, they were undetected by the police, and they blew up the highway just as the car went over it. And I was so moved by it, and it's so present, it's so present that I was in Sicily last year. I went to Falcone's apartment, which has a little memorial to him out front. This memorial, people add to it all the time. They leave things. 30 years later, they leave things in gratitude for what he tried to do to save them from criminals, murderers, extortionists. It's so moving to me and it's so important to loyalty because so much about loyalty we take for granted, for, about law we take for granted and justice we take for granted. And so with respect to the Inquisition, you see how justice can be warped and do evil. But today in Sicily, justice was served. It's late. I don't, it's, it's too late in my view, but it's here. And that man is going to prison for the rest of his life. I hope that it will um, make a serious dent in the mob in Sicily, if not end it, but I'm not that optimistic in that regard. And we'll, we'll wait to see that. But you know about it now. It, Chris, it is a horror. Um, but I, but I take hope because today the good guys actually won and justice was done. So in memory of Borsellino and Giovanni Falcone, who by all accounts was just, these were lovely, dedicated, brilliant, brilliant lawyers fighting for justice. Justice was served for them. Now for something completely different. And then we're going to get to something, my cooking demonstration. This is the part we do other author spotlight when Lisa actually stops talking about herself for a moment and talks about an author she loves, really, really loves, namely Kristen Hanna. I am sure you have read Kristen Hanna. If you haven't, you're going to start after tonight. But let me read to you because Kristen Hanna is so nice. When I finished Loyalty, 
She is the queen, queen, queen of historical fiction. When I finished Loyalty, I wrote her an email. I said, Kristen, if you have some time, would you read this book? And if you like it, please say so. And she wrote back and she wrote a wonderful blurb, which is on the cover of Loyalty. And here's what Kristen Hanna said, which just makes me so happy and honored. She said, a gripping, compulsively readable tale of courage, loyalty, family secrets, and the price of honor. An unputdownable piece of historical fiction that puts Scottolini's talent for writing twisty plots and unforgettable characters on full display. Kristen Hanna, number one New York Times bestselling author of The Four Winds. I am so grateful to Krista. Kristen, I have been reading her forever and ever and ever. Let me show you. First off, let me give you the short course in Kristen and Hannah. First off, as you know, I love to read and I love certain authors. There are some authors I must buy and there's some authors I must collect. I collect Kristen and Hannah. You can see the shiny cover. You can see, I will read, she wrote to me, to Lisa, you rock. That makes me so happy. This book, The Nightingale, is a sensational book. You undoubtedly have read it already, but if you haven't, you should get it right away. It is amazing. It's going to be a movie. I think that's coming out soon, starring the Fanning Sisters. It is a wonderful Holocaust novel, but it's really about the France, and it's really about, and I think this is what Kristen's known for too and what I love about her, the strong independent women of the French resistance. I didn't know anything about that before I picked up this book. And I picked up the book because I read everything written by Kristen. Here we go. Let me show you my signed collection. I won't show you all the time she writes, you rock, but maybe I will. The Great Alone, sensational novel about Alaska. The Four Winds, which is the most recent one about the United States and all about the Dust Bowl and the history then, and also the incredible resilience of its women main character. These women main characters, you never forget. Homefront, I think she was a helicopter pilot. Amazing, amazing book. Fly Away, another one. Amazing. This is my Kristen Hanna collection. I could not get, get enough of her. Firefly Lane, are you watching it on Netflix? You must, it is so great because not only is it about these strong women characters, but honestly, it's about their friendship. And I have such good friends, Laura, my bestie, Franca, my bestie, Francesca's my bestie. We all form such good friendships and over time, I don't see a lot of that on TV. I wish I could see more of it. And I was so, so glad when Firefly Lane came out. I am following that saga. And I hope you are too, but it's, it started here. So read the book. I'm going to keep going, then I'll stop. Winter Garden, amazing book. True cult, you see my entire collection. Night Road, which I also loved. Chris and Hannah writes great books and I buy books by the author. So I know that anything I get from her will be reliably awesome. And I will get swept up in the story and I will love it. And I do, so if you have not read Chris and Hannah, which I would be very surprised if you hadn't, but please, please give her a try. You will thank me, you will love me, and you will love her. Chris and Hannah rocks Eduardo Ballerini, who is a so-called golden voice. It, he is the maestro. I asked for him more, more accurately. I begged for him to do it. You should listen to him read these books. I listen to him read my books and I listen to him read other people's books because, and I could tell you, the Lehman Trilogy, The Flores of Sicily. Um, I listen to him read Dante. I listen to him read T.S. Eliot. He is amazing. Audiobooks are amazing. Get some and download them and listen to them. This is a little card from Termini Brothers. What is Termini Brothers? Termini Brothers is a amazing Sicilian pastry place what is that called? Bakery. <laughs> in Philadelphia. It has been in Philadelphia forever. I love it. I grew up going there in South Philly. Everybody knows. Every Somebody said my pastine is getting cold. Yay for Ruth. Terminis is straight up authentic. They make stuff from Sicilian recipes. What is tonight's giveaway for next week? I want to take the time to show you this because it's so cool. If you haven't gotten this book yet, you should because this is an amazing prize. Here is next week. It is from Germany. What is it? It is a cannoli kit. It is a make your own cannolis. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. 12 cannolis. This comes to your house. The shell, 
vacuum pack so it doesn't get all broken and crappy. And right, you get to make cannoli in your house, only you don't have to bake it. You understand what I'm telling you? There are, look at this. Is this the greatest thing ever? Let me tell you why I love this so much and why I picked it. First, it's Italian. Second, it's Italian. Third, it's Sicilian. Fourth is carbohydrates. Fifth, I frigging love cannoli. And six, you can make it and it's kind of fun. Like, look, it's football season. This is like a little activity. I'll show you how you make it because I'm going to try to make it. I've actually done this before, but I didn't do it this. And obviously, this is the special refrigerated thing that you get. Look what you get. And by the way, uh, uh, you're not going to get this one. I'm going to get you a fresh one. I'm not like a piker. Come on, I'm going to make you eat my leftovers. Vanilla filling. You know what a cannoli is, right? They, they're, in, they're Sicilian. I'm not even going to get dirty on you, but when I was there, everybody reminded me, including the bakery research people, that it's in the shape of, you can imagine, because it's about fertility. You're right. But in any event, it will actually, it kind of is. And you saw the nuns making the cannoli, which is very weird. But in any event, here is the cannoli, as you can see right through. So it comes just like this. And then what comes in the, with the 12 cannolis, the shells, are vanilla. This is the inside part. Saving that for last. Chocolate, vanilla, and chocolate. Get it? Very nice flavors, very delicious. Would you like me to tell you what my favorite? No, that's stupid. My favorite flavor is the chocolate chip. It's ricotta or rigot, if you're Italian, and chocolate chip with chocolate chips in it. It is on, you take the thing. I'm going to try to do this for you, but I'll do it fast because I know you have a life. You cut the top off. You try not to wait. I had to do that. Oh my God. It's so good. It is so good. It's ricotta with chocolate chips inside. Then you take the thing and you squeak. Can you see? Watch my incredible technique. Let's see how much I can get on my laptop. Oh, look at the good job I did. Look, now you probably have to. I brought a little spoon because you might have to shove some in there. But wouldn't this be a fun little activity? You get it? Look at this. Look at this. If if I can do it, you can do it. Oh my God in heaven. Is this the coolest thing ever? This is really fun. You get these 12 things sent to your house, all nice and fresh, stays in the refrigerator. Three days, I think. You get the fillings. This is the one you go for first. I'm giving you the tip. The ricotta with the chocolate chip. It's unbelievably good. You could stick this in your vein and die happy. This, and you make your own cannolis, and then you have 12 cannolis. The kids get to make their own, whoever you have around. You invite your friends over. How about your book club? You say, oh, we're having cannoli night, courtesy of Scottolini. It's a party. I think this is the coolest. We give away a lot of prizes. Some that are more expensive than this. Well, plenty of them are more expensive than this, but I think this is the coolest, coolest, coolest one. And I, oh my God, it's unbelievable. I just got it yesterday. It's unbelievably fresh. I can't, the good thing is I can give myself a brain freeze. So all right, I will stop picking out on you. It's 8.05, so I ran a little late. I just want to say, do I have food in my teeth? That's great. They just get lipstick on my face. That's also good. Thank you very, very much for being here. I really, really appreciate you. I'm so grateful that you come week to week and that you enter the contest and that you support me. And I support you back and I love you back. Please remember the thank you part of our show because that's the most important part. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With love, with carbohydrates, and a lot of sugar. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.